many years. As a matter of fact, I think right from the very beginning. And Bob was one of the, uh, as far as I was concerned, he was the outreach guy. Because he taught uh, telescope building and had a lot of telescopes, uh, his family and such. He was uh, the guy that when I entered the club really came and, and, uh, and kind of put me under his ring initially. So he's like uh, he's a forerunner. He just passed away a week ago. Um, and, uh, uh, and we all miss him. And this is a tribute to, to Bob. And I have posed to the club that we have an actual outreach um, uh, award. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be given every year, but uh, in the name of Bob Watt, I think that, that would be appropriate, but we really don't have to get that through the board. So, um, uh, with that being all that, uh, he was a. Uh, uh, we're really going to miss him. Uh, what I'm going to do first is we're going to do an in the news for this. Uh, meeting, uh, we these all these in the news stories. Well, I, why don't I just do this one first, and then we can go from there. Do we need to kill some lights? If you want, I don't. It doesn't, it's pretty bright, so I mean, if okay. you want to want to dim them down, I don't. I don't have a problem. I wouldn't want them off though. All of them. I just uh, maybe, just yeah, that's probably fine. Okay. In the news for February the twentieth. 2014, um, there, uh, uh, there was a report about the moon. Uh, seeds of life can sprout in the moon's icy pockets. Ice pockets on the moon uh, could be cooking the building blocks of life. Simulations show that cosmic rays coming from outside the galaxy have enough energy to turn simple molecules in lunar ice into more complex organics, carbon-based compounds central to life on Earth. 2009, a spacecraft sent crashing into the moon's south pole, kicked up water vapor, probably melted from ice trapped in the shadow <coughs> craters. Uh, that water contained organics, but no one was sure how they got there. Comets have also have organics in their ices, so it's possible that the moon's carbon-laden water was delivered by impacts. Uh, but Sarah Kreitz of the University of Hawaii uh, wondered if the moon could instead be whipping up its organics from scratch. Kreitz and her team modeled an ice, the icy chemistry using radiation data from lunar orbiters and concluded that cosmic rays spiking, uh, striking lunar ice are indeed powerful enough to spark the reactions that would turn basic molecules into organics. Ken? Okay. Yes? Can I speak up a little bit? All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have a little bit on this, this fellow, Kepler. Um, Kepler, uh, exoplanet hunter, sees its first world after being revived. It's alive after suffering a critical injury last year and NASA's Kepler Space Telescope has just observed an exoplanet for the first time in months. The Jupiter-sized world is not a new discovery. It was found by another telescope, but spotting it again with Kepler's is solid evidence that, the, the, that following a few modifications, the famed planet hunter is ready to get back to work. Launched in 2009, Kepler was designed to see planetary transits, the tiny dips in the starlight, when a planet passes in front of a star from Earth's perspective. Over four years, the mission collected almost 250 confirmed planets and thousands of more candidates, boosting their confidence that the galaxy is brimming with alien worlds. Sometimes this thing is a little bulky. Um, well, we thought it was dead, and uh, the China's Jade Rabbit moon rover is starting to phone home, I guess. Reports of the moon's bunny's death may be somewhat exaggerated, despite earlier suggestions that China's lunar rover U-2, or Jade Rabbit, had been officially declared bad. Chinese state media now says that the rabbit has phoned home. It remains unclear, though, whether the rover is healthy enough to continue its mission. A new statement from state media agency Xinhua reports that the Chinese space agency has seen signs of life from U-2 and a website that records amateur monitoring of radio signals from space has received a downlink signal from YouTube, according to Planetary Society. Um, Earth is prepared enough for the next asteroids uh, strike. Again, this is somewhat related to one of the stories we'll be going through. Next Russian-style meteor strike may come as a complete surprise, but that may be okay. 
uh, study of a potential early warning system has found that it will miss more than half of, uh, of incoming space rocks the size of the one that burst apart in, above Russia a year ago. However, the chances of such a meteor causing a dangerous impact are so low that catch-all warning systems are not worth the cost. The uh, meteor that struck Robert was a 65-foot-long rock, uh, rock that unexpectedly hurled to the Earth's atmosphere on 15 February 2013. Explored it with a, uh, a force of about 600 kilotons of TNT, creating a shock wave that shattered windows and knocked people off their feet. And there'll be more about that later on. And the last thing is, is we've noticed a dark halo around spiral galaxies, which poses a stellar mystery. The pinwheel galaxy is is a darker place than we suspected. Other large spiral galaxies, such as the Milky Way, boast star-speckled outer shells called stellar halos. But the edges of the pinwheel galaxy are mysteriously barren, putting a wrinkle in one of the most widely held theories of, of galaxy growth. We think galaxies get bigger either via colliding or merging with large neighbors or by snacking on dwarf galaxies that fall into their gravitational grasp. But big collisions tend to mangle galaxies and spirals take several uh, billion years to settle into their nor ordinary, or orderly shapes. So we think most of the spirals we see today grew by gobbling up uh, nearby dwarfs. This process rips the dwarf galaxies apart and over billions of years leave behind a faint halo of orphan stars that surrounds the larger galaxy. We have seen such halos around the Milky Way and our closest neighbor Andromeda. Simulations suggest that they could be common around spirals across the universe. And that's uh, and we had a monster uh, asteroid 2000 EM26 that whizzed by the Earth. Um, it was never considered a threat. Its closest came to the Earth was about two million miles. It's a rocky body about 885 miles in diameter. The asteroid's pass was screened by the, the astronomy site SLUCOM. The images the site showed came from a telescope located in Dubai. They show a dark night sky filled with stars but with no asteroid visible. The technical team spent Monday, uh, last Monday night reviewing the images but were not seeing a lot of detail. Astronomers knew the asteroid would be a little fainter than Pluto. Uh, some watching and, and commenting on Twitter complained, complained the images were boring. Others noted boring was a good outcome, having that if it hit us. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the thing. No, really. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take, we have this in the news segment for those of you who haven't been to the meetings, I think for those of you who have, every meeting we have about five to ten minutes just like I gave just now. At the end of the year what I do is I bring all those stories together, there's about 165 of them a year approximately, and then we send them out to several of the members who pick out what their favorite stories were. Some of them stand out, some of them are intrinsically more interesting, and what we've done is we've divided this talk up into the members here. Uh, I will be giving several of the stories a couple of people didn't show tonight and also they're, they're pretty easy. Most of the stories will take around seven to eight minutes, a couple of them a little longer, a couple of them a little shorter, and the, way, the speed at which I speak, the likelihood is mine will be a little bit shorter. So um, and the way uh, Dave Bailey speaks, it could be a little longer. So, <laughs> okay, all right. so uh, without further uh, conversation, this is a presentation that should take us with about a 20 minute break somewhere along the way for, for then we'll probably <coughs> take it after we get to the 10th story. What we did back this year, different than other years, we didn't necessarily rank them in the most important ones down to the most important at the bottom. We took categories of them and then we took the most important uh, story in the category and there's a couple of them that are outstanding, the last four or five are absolutely the most interesting stories of the year. Uh, and would be selected by Astronomy Magazine, Sky and Telescope, and everybody else. So what we've done is several of us are going to be giving this presentation. I will introduce them, and then they we've put it all on one <coughs> keynote presentation, PowerPoint type, and we will just run through it right now. And as we move along, if we have time at the end, if you want any more specifics about it, you certainly can ask us, and we we'll probably have the answers for you. All the people that are here have researched a lot of this information <coughs> uh, beyond where I originally put the story together. And they've used some of my images, but most of them have done it on their own, and, and quite frankly, a crack-up job. They really have, and I appreciate the input. Here we go. So this is in the news for 
2013 by yours truly and friends. And our first set of stories are from Dave Bailey, which cover cosmology and physics, basically. And he has several stories. What we're going to do is we're going to review a couple of the ones we considered, and then what we're going to do is Dave is going to make it a little more intensive study on that. Is there anybody who doesn't have a hand about? Okay, one of the past handouts to those people. How many people? One, two, three, three, okay, three, four. Okay, four. One of the stories was on runaway stars filling the blanks in the Milky Way gap. Another was the mystery of cosmic rays origin finally solved. Is it's story been solved on? many times and uh, <laughs> right. previous solutions have been wrong. Right. Okay. Uh, we have also the Planck mat revealing the birth, life, and death of the co in the cosmos. And uh, now we okay. let David go. So go for All it. All right. Um, this one is um, called <coughs> Super Gentle Star Mergers. Uh, because another one that I'm covering is really violent star collisions. Um, and there's a number of ways that stars can merge together. This is very rare, by the way. The most likely way, I think, uh, is probably where you've got a close binary system, and one of the stars pushes its envelope outwards, its outer atmosphere, thin outer atmosphere, so that the envelope includes both stars. And that is commonly called a common envelope star. Somebody brilliant thought up that name for a star with uh, two stars with one envelope. Um, and um, on your, whatever page this is, the first page called Super Gentle Star Mergers, there's a little chart that tells how such a star looks at the beginning of a maybe merger process. And um, basically, the, most of the shared envelope material gathers around the companion star instead of going off into space as a stellar wind. Um, and what happens then is uh, the uh, secondary star slowly, ever so slowly spirals inwards. I'm not talking about spiraling inwards in weeks. I'm talking about spiraling inwards in millions of years. But the process gradually goes faster and faster. And the subsequent paragraphs tell you basically how that happens. Um, and the uh, star eventually, uh, the secondary star finally falls right through the photosphere of the main star. And strange to say, it keeps on spiraling. Why? Because this primary star has a huge, huge envelope, and, and the photosphere is way out, and the material is, in a physics lab on Earth, that material will be considered an extremely good vacuum. It's, it's not dense. And so the secondary can fall right through the photosphere and just keep on spiraling and spiraling and spiraling inwards. It spirals faster and faster. Um, and eventually, the, the star will have encountered the same amount of mass as it weighs itself. When that kind of thing starts to happen, the spiraling becomes really quick. In the last two or three turns, ending with an almost vertical dive down towards the center of the, of the main star, that happens really fast, like weeks maybe, days, hours, depending on the size and the mass of, these, of the two stars. And that last dive inwards, it liberates a huge, huge amount of gravitational energy. Uh, basically, the stars weigh a lot. And when you drop a large, heavy object on top of a large, another larger, heavier object, it liberates an awful lot of energy. And the amount of energy that can be liberated is equivalent to several million years worth, maybe dozens of millions of years worth, of nuclear fusion in those stars. And so that means after that energy is released, the star can breathe a sigh of relief and say, I don't have to fuse any hydrogen for 50 million more years, because I've got all this energy in the bank. Well, it doesn't stay in the bank. It basically blows the outer layers off of the star. And you can end up with something that looks sort of like, what was V838? Go back up a little. And this is not actually showing material blowing off a star. This is showing material that was blown off the star in the past, maybe a million years ago. This is a light echo. Something made the star flare up briefly, 
and the light echo, the light has gone out this far, and you, it's lighting up that, uh, that, that material out there. Um, this is a really cool star. It's like a one of a kind. Like, when you categorize variable stars, this one gets its own category. Because <coughs> like, there's maybe two other stars that are sort of similar to it. Um, Want to go on? Next we've got Eta Carinae. Uh, this is another possible kind of stellar merger. Um, it's unclear whether this is a merger or not. Uh, it may have merged in 1843. In 1843, this star became like the second brightest star in the, in the sky. It was like a magnitude minus one, and, and uh, Sirius is magnitude minus about one and a half. Um, this is a very bright star, and you can see that material got pushed out from the star in two directions to make those two big blobs, plus it's sort of squirting out sideways here. Um, and that material probably weighs several times what the sun weighs. It's quite a bit of stuff. Um, so there might have been a merger that took place then, um, or maybe not. And um, there's a diagram here on the one of the subsequent pages that shows what I think that system might look like. I think Eta Carinae is a triple star system. Um, this one I did not cover. Um, it's sort of, I would be surprised if the Milky Way galaxy was not fluttering like a flag. Uh, this is one of my uh, hobbies. I reverse headlines and see if they're more exciting than the negated version. And if I, if I saw it say, the Milky Way is not fluttering like a flag, I would have said, wow, I didn't know that. Um, brightest cosmic burst, I don't know what, what this is. Uh, does it identify what object that is? No, I don't know. You want to get to this one, right? Okay, mysterious stardust really mergers into skies. Yeah, uh, this goes back to the first page in my handout, um, which is about stars that collide with each other while they're orbiting around the galactic black hole that's at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. And those collisions can be incredibly violent because the velocities involved are like 10,000 kilometers per second. The Earth orbits the sun at about 30 kilometers per second. We're talking about 10,000 kilometers per second. The escape velocity from the surface of the sun is uh, on the order of 600 kilometers per second. So this is like, what, 16 times faster than escape velocity? So if you've got two stars that come at each other at, at those speeds, well, stuff happens. Um, and there's a diagram here the, on the first page that shows what kind of stars we're talking about, certain kinds of main sequence stars, maybe. Um, there's a diagram on the right side of the page that shows different angles that stars can approach each other, like head-on. Head-on is extremely rare. More likely is, you know, some kind of other angle like that, or like that, or two stars coming in like that, or almost parallel to each other. Um, and uh, the amount of energy that's available depends on the angle of approach. Big surprise. Um, there's some other uh, factors that affect the amount of energy that's available. There's a diagram here that shows how close a star can hit another star, um, what, what kind of misalignment there could be. You can have two uh, stars that come at each other head on, but just miss. So the point is head on is not the same as bullseye. Head on means the velocity vectors are opposed. Bullseye means that you've scored a direct hit like that. Um, and so this tells about you know the how that all plays out, how much energy is available under what circumstances. Um, what happens? Well, basically, uh, this right-hand image here on the, the, the third third picture that I gave you. Um, well, let's look at the left-hand one. It shows a red dwarf star colliding with a star like Vega, and when you bring a white dwarf, a red dwarf star in and collide it with a star like Vega at 10,000 kilometers per second, the kinetic energy is enough to splatter Vega all over the sky. And you're hitting it with this itty bitty 
white and red dwarf that doesn't only weighs 0 0.6 and Vega weighs 2.5. Uh, so when you've got collisions that are this fast, you can disassemble whole stars if the if the collision is anywhere near a bullseye. Bullseye is a very, very rare, of course. As a, um, here's a kind of a uh, uh, artist conception, the black hole is shown way too tiny and the stars are shown way too big. If you just make that black hole like uh, a million times bigger and make the stars ten times smaller, then that's more or less the way it should look. Um, and uh, those collisions, they produce enough heat that you can make hydrogen fuse, like in one second. Normally, hydrogen fuse is like in the center of the sun. It takes a billion years to fuse a significant quantity, like 10 billion years to fuse it all up. And here we're talking about burning up a substantial fraction of the hydrogen in the star in one second. That's pretty amazing. Um, next item. This is the third item uh, towards the end, on the last page, basically. Um, neutrinos from outer space. There's this uh, detector called Ice Cube, which is a cubic <coughs> kilometer of ice in Antarctica, where they have basically drilled holes and lowered light detectors down the holes. And they've got uh, 5,160 photo sensors in one cubic kilometer of Antarctic ice. I don't know where they come up with the name ice cube. Doesn't make any sense. It's great. Maybe it does make sense. Mm -hmm. um, we're running out of time. So. We're running out of time. Well, I've only got a half, uh, a half a page left, so we're doing great. Um, ice cube has detected two neutrino events of approximately 1,000 terabolts energy. That's 10 to the 15 electron volts. And what kind of object has a molecular weight of a million? Because that's, that's the, the mass energy equivalent of, of this neutrino. The answer is 16 hemoglobin molecules, each of which has four polypeptide chains. That adds up to a weight of about a million. So thinking of a, a single subatomic particle having that much energy, that's sort of amazing. Um, another way to look at it, fusing 140 million protons into 35 million helium nuclei releases that amount of energy. And then it tells a little bit about the consequences, the implications of those observations. Basically, the implications are, we don't know where they're coming from, so we don't know. So the next step is to use the ice cube as a telescope. Look and see what direction these flashes come from. And we might be able to make some guesses about what kind of processes create these really energetic neutrinos. Their prediction is high. However, as it says in the latest sentence, that's high for a neutrino cosmic ray. But normal cosmic rays can have energies as much as 100,000 times more than that. And the last one. Those, the amount of energy in one of those top of the line regular cosmic rays is the same amount of kinetic energy as a good hard tennis serve. That's really amazing. David, you got to get wrap it up with this one. Uh, same story. Same story appeared like twice in the year, like 10 months apart. So I can save some time by covering them both. That shows basically the configuration of the detectors that saw one of these flashes. And you can see it's pretty much of a, de uh, a bullseye hit on the detector because that red area, which presumably means the most light that was seen, is right in the middle of the detector. So how did they position that detector to pick up that cosmic ray? They were really lucky. Um, anything else for me? Nope, you got it. Okay, Thank he you, gave David. me like 40 stories, and I whittled it down to four, two of which were I didn't want, so I only had to do three. And you only went over for my four minutes, that's okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Our next presentation is by Chuck Gisela, uh, Spacecraft and Missions.
So I've got uh, four different stories here that I'm going to go over out of, I don't know how many in total, but uh, focuses on uh, specific spacecraft and specific missions. So first off, uh, NASA Grail mission ends with twin moon smashes. So the, uh, the twin spacecraft Ebb and Flow, as they're named, are part of the Grail project, which is Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory, uh, NASA space project. Um, the initial aim of the project was to have these two probes in orbit around the moon and have them be essentially um, uh, kind of uh, uh, in a single file orbit, so one following the other in the same orbit, with the idea that they could measure gravitational anomalies by whether or not the probes would move closer together or further apart at various parts of, of the orbit in order to determine is there any inhomogeneity in the gravitational field of the moon. But in order to get the most bang for the buck out of this particular project, they decided at the mission end, let's collide these probes into the moon uh, send up a plume of material from, from the moon's crust and analyze the composition of that material from the uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter, uh, which was positioned to be able to take those measurements. Um, so the, uh, the crash was successful, occurred on December 17th. Um, they did some compositional analysis. And the main idea was to try to understand more about the moon's atmosphere. It's not really much of an atmosphere, it's a very tenuous um, bit of gas that's being held to the lunar surface by gravity. But the idea is that uh, perhaps the cosmic rays uh, that are striking the lunar surface or the solar wind is somehow interacting with the moon's surface to generate this, this very thin atmosphere. Uh, so uh, that was the, um, the NASA Grail mission coming to an end. So if you go to the next one, Ben. Uh, the second mission that I wanted to overview is the Xenon Ion Engine. Um, uh, makes space travel a rhapsody in blue. This is one of the, uh, in the news items. Um, so basically the, the bottom line here is that um, uh, there are traditional chemical rocket engines which are used to put um, uh, things into space. A lot of energy is expended in a very short period of time necessary to, to overcome Earth's gravitational field. But uh, uh, xenon ion propulsion um, is really useful because of the fact that uh, you know, it, can move a probe over a, uh, uh, you know, it's a much more economical, much more efficient way of moving a probe. And uh, once you get something into orbit, you can move it around to, uh, to different orbits, go out and explore different parts of the solar system um, in a much more cost effective and efficient way for these long range missions. Uh, so what you see here is a blue glow that's coming from the photons. Those photons are released by the ions as they lose energy coming out of the, uh, out of the thruster. So you're seeing here the thruster that's inside of a vacuum chamber at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, incidentally, um, an early version of this was used in the Dawn spacecraft, uh, which was uh, sent to Vesta and is now en route to uh, Ceres. And that um, the one that you see pictured here will actually be used in upcoming spacecraft, including potentially the Asteroid Initiative, which is a mission to, uh, to capture an asteroid and move it into Earth orbit so that it can be studied in more detail. Uh, next one, Ken. Uh, so the third one, I, this is a two-slide um, discussion on this one. So boxy CubeSats get a propulsion boost in the space race. So CubeSats, the idea is to make really small, very cheap satellites that are literally just you know, two, two pounds, a little bit more than two pounds in mass, in weight, and uh, four inches on each side, so very tiny. And uh, if you can make these cheaply and make them small, then you can make more of them and um, you know, more, better, faster, cheaper is kind of the mantra of late uh, for trying to get the most bang for the buck out of the space program. So this is an interesting idea and one that could do a lot to, uh, to, to maybe uh, explore things on the cheap. So uh, uh, if you just jump back real quick, Ken, okay. you jumped ahead of me there. I'm sorry. Um, so there are two groups working on this. Uh, one is Paul Lozano, he's at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, um, and he has a plan where um, the prospective CubeSats would be uh, launched in two separate launches in 2014. And he has a major competitor, uh, Benjamin Longmire at uh, U of M Ann Arbor. Uh, and that he also has a plan to launch some CubeSats uh, in 2014 as well. Now you can jump to the next one here. Is, um, so the Lozano group is uh, basing their work on the idea of an ionic liquid propulsion system, which is pretty unique. So they've got a metal chip that's being soaked with an ionic fluid, and that by um, uh, having an electric field induced on that chip, then you can essentially stream out uh, streamers of that ionic fluid and create propulsion 
uh, through the stream of, of ions coming off of this, uh, this grid. It's very scalable, very cost effective, very able to work in this kind of micro sized environment. Um, whereas Longmire's taking a more traditional approach, he's got a CubeSat <coughs> antipolar thruster, which is uh, again using kind of a xenon ion propulsion type system. Uh, but there's some scalability issues there. He's uh, actually using a permanent magnet to, to better collimate the ions to get uh, more efficiency out of it. So stay tuned on this. This is a tight race, and it's a very impressive project and one that could have future implications. Uh, next, Ken. And finally, uh, Cosmic Explorer Gaia uh, embarks on star mapping mission. So the Gaia probe that uh, was launched, it's a mission by the European uh, Space Agency, uh, blasted off on December 19. Um, and then uh, took about three weeks time to reach the second Lagrangian point, L2. So the Lagrangian point is a point, uh, well, there are several Lagrangian points, but L2 specifically is opposite um, the Earth from the Sun. So it's perpetually on the dark side of the Earth. And it just so happens that at L2, the various gravitational forces are equalized so it can remain there and that um, uh, be essentially static relative to the Earth and the Sun. So it's a great place to do science because you're essentially on the dark side of the Earth looking outward. Um, so the, the goal of this experiment is to, uh, over a five year span, um, measure about a billion different stars within the Milky Way galaxy, very precisely determine their position, um, their relative um, uh, speed and the distance to them in order to have a better idea of the uh, evolution of the Milky Way galaxy. And that pretty much wraps up the uh, Great, thank you, sir. items I have. Yeah? What are they trying to do with the cube satellites rather than... Well, there's a number of proposed things. I mean, it's in the preliminary stages, but one idea is that you can have them in orbit around Earth, have a network of them, and basically have global Wi-Fi was one of the ideas that they were thinking of. Another thought is that you could essentially have um, small probes that you could send out in mass and do exploration um, you know, for a much lower budget. The idea was that if you could do most of the things with a CubeSat that you could with a regular size satellite, you know, have on their sensors, have on their miniature cameras, then you could do Lots uh, for the same price in terms of solar system exploration. Next. <laughs> Next one is one of mine is on the foreign missions. Uh, some of the foreign missions that we considered were the Indians' first mission to Mars. Uh, it recovered from a glitch during the period of time. There's a Japanese probe that's to staff out, sniff out why planets lose gases. Nigeria has been using sas satellites for exploration. China is building its own space station, and uh, the astronauts came back from a trip there. Those were the, some of the ones that we considered, but the one that we found is most interesting was China's Jade Rabbit, which was uh, launched um, uh, into uh, lunar orbit on the 6th of December and touched down on the surface on the 14th of December and released a rover. The Chinese craft uh, is the first to land on the moon since the Soviet Union's 24 mission in 1976 and will beat the, team, the teams competing for the Google Lunar X Drive in effort to spur private teams to explore the moon. Um, a little bit more about this, uh, this, this thing that kind of shut down a bit for a while, uh, and it, it's, uh, as we said in the story, it's starting to phone home again. We don't know what's going to happen with it, but uh, it's on the moon, and it's been a while since the moon has, been, has had a house guest, and China send, sent the lander, and and uh, the rover to the lunar surface, and again, it was the first attempt to be there in 37 years. Uh, China aims to use robots to return lunar material to the Earth for study around 2017. Prepare for this, two previous Chinese, Chinese probes took images of the moon from orbit. Latest mission, uh, Chang-3, will be China's first lunar touchdown. It includes a six-wheeled rover that has been named U-2, Y-U-T-U, and, uh, or Jade Rabbit. Uh, after the mythological pet of the lunar goddess uh, Shang-Yi. Uh, this uh, uh, detailed of the missions uh, are, are up in the air at this point in time until they can get it working again uh, to, their, uh, to their effort. Um, and that's the end of that one. See how we pick up time? Bang, bang? Okay. <laughs> All right. Now we go into the solar system. This is uh, solar system news and moon discoveries. Well, one of the interesting stories of the year was actually near the end of uh, 2012. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there was a Nile-like river crossing Saturn. We've been seeing uh, Titan moons Titan. 
and um, uh, the topography of Titan has become very interesting to us as being similar to the Earth. Uh, there's also, uh, there was a report about solar activity heading to the lowest low in four centuries, and uh, there was also a report about the Earth's uh, spin being stuttered and uh, changing the, day, the length of the day going forward. But the reports that we liked the best were these, the huge lava fountains seen gushing from Jupiter's moon, Io, um, on August the 15th, the Keck 2 telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii recorded fountains of lava gushing from fissures in the rare rock of Patera region of Io. Uh, by the way, it is Io, but it is pronounced Eo. Okay, heated by gravitational squeezing from Jupiter and its other moons, Io is covered with volcanoes that erupt almost continuously. This event is easily in the top ten yet seen on Io by humans. Uh, we, we, uh, um, Ashley Davies of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab said we tried to look at EO at every opportunity in the hope of seeing something like this. This time we got lucky. Lava fountains spouted mount molten rock over a hundred miles from the EO surface, erupting over an area of totaling 20 square miles. The Galileo spacecraft, which toured the Jovian system from 1995 to 2003, was the last mission to get a close, near constant view of the action on EO. But other monitoring efforts, like the Keck program, have helped make it clear just how much violent it's capable of. Biggest eruption seen so far happened in 2001 when the Keck Observatory saw a lava flow that is thought to have spread many hundreds of square kilometers across the U.S. surface. Uh, and in 2007, New Horizons probe spotted a huge plume from a volcano called Shvastar as it flew fast on its way to Pluto. Uh, the rocky body roughly the size of our moon. Uh, it was relatively low gravitory, almost no atmosphere, uh, and the volcanic eruptions make it the most active volcanically in the solar system. Well, the other story that we saw was uh, fresh water plumes seen firing from Jupiter's moon Europa. Water plumes spark a race to Jupiter and moon Europa. Europa, the icy moon of Jupiter, has been caught spitting into space. For the first time, a towering plume of water vapor has been seen coming from it. The discovery strengthens the case that the moon has a liquid ocean beneath its icy crust and may even offer a way to taste its seas to search for signs of life. Images from the Galileo spacecraft, which orbited Jupiter from 1995 to 2003 again, revealed a cracked and chaotic surface dominated by dark ridges and faults. This hinted that Europa has a relatively thin crust in which fissures sometimes open up and let water escape from a subsurface ocean. Similar rifts on Saturn's icy moon Enceladus shoot spectacular water geysers, but the Galileo probe did not spot any plumes in action on Europa, and later efforts also came up empty. Now images taken by Hubble Space Telescope have revealed a large cloud of hydrogen and oxygen, most likely in the form of water vapor, extending from the moon's south pole. A model suggests that the plume is 125 miles high and is spouting 6,600 6, pounds of water per second. And the last of the, uh, of the um, uh, studies on this is we found another moon <coughs> of, uh, of Neptune. Um, it has a new moon and its existence is an enigma. The object known for now as S2004N1 is the first Neptunian moon to be found in a decade. Its diminutive size raises questions as how it survived the chaos thought to have created the giant planet's other moons. The faint moon was discovered in archived images from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and uh, the rings around our outermost planet are too faint to see without taking very long exposures. However, the rings orbit so fast that uh, taking one long shot would smear them across the frame. Showwater, uh, who is uh, Mark Showwater of SETI, and colleagues gathered multiple shorter images, exposure images to develop a technique of digitally rewind the orbits at the same point in time then they could stack several images on top of each other to reveal details of the rings, and what they got was this little moon. And that is the story on that. I get the next one as well. Okay, Pan Stars, Lovejoy, this is a real short report, uh, and after this report we'll take our break. Um, uh, Pan Stars, Lovejoy, and uh, the 5913, uh, actually it's 59 and 51013 annular eclipse and the 11313 hybrid eclipse. A hybrid eclipse is simply an eclipse where the sun, the moon just covers the sun's surface 
for a very brief time. It's usually partially annular uh, in its nature. It doesn't happen very often, but we do get them every, every about every about 18 years about. So it's usually the same one. I think there's a couple in the 18-year Saros cycle. So let's move on. Uh, this is a picture of the annual solar eclipse of, ne of uh, May 9, 10, 2013. Uh, that is when the moon is too far away to cover the entire uh, sun's surface, uh, about a distance of about 240,000 miles. Uh, you can see the path of the eclipse. You have to be on that center line in order to see that puppy, and that's where you would have had to have been to see uh, annularity. Uh, the hybrid eclipse uh, uh, went across uh, Africa, and actually the ideal place they figured to be seen was in Kenya. However, it was completely clouded out in Kenya. But there were some uh, pictures, and this is one of the pictures that you see. That little brightening part there is sometimes known as the diamond ring effect, making it look like diamond rings. That's why my wife likes to travel to eclipses, so she can see diamond rings and Bailey's beats, and that's the reason that she goes. So there you go on that. Moving on, uh, Comet Lovejoy was the one that did, as they say, uh, as opposed to ISA. <laughs> And uh, this is a picture from the Subaru telescope uh, on, on Hawaii, uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, it put on a pretty nice show. It was visible to the naked eye. Um, Pan Stars was the one that everybody got to photograph, including Diane and, 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 uh, and Jonathan and I. We got to do some photographing of that along with others. And this gives a little bit of an idea of its path. Pan stars was pretty nice. It wasn't terribly bright, but it was probably fourth magnitude. I would figure maybe third, and uh, nice to look at. I went out with a couple of my friends, and we did a couple of exposures of it um, with uh, using ISO 8000 with the 10 second exposure and uh, for the two second exposure. And also one of our friends, Mark Christensen from the west side of the state, took a couple of really nice images as well, and it turned out to be a pretty neat little uh, gadget. And Diane will be next up, and uh, that's um, and we will probably now take about a 12-minute break, maybe oh, 15.